racism emerges really in the 16th and, and 17th, particularly the 17th century. Uh, Europeans were enslaving and had for some centuries been enslaving people uh, both of Africa and of the New World. The history of racism in the Western world is broadly associated with slavery as the early form of colonialism. And it's in that context that something called race is created, which essentially means that certain people who are defined as non-Europeans find themselves ruled and governed by Europeans. For people in America in the 17th and the 18th century, race was a fact of life. And I think that racism is something that comes out of that interaction of necessity. This isn't people cooking up racism in their laboratory or in their study and then going out into the world to apply it. In a sense, white people yeah, and blacks and Indians worked out their ideas of race in proximity with each other on the hoof. The British don't become slave traders and slavers because they are racist. They become racist because they use slaves for great profit in the Americas and devise a set of attitudes towards black people that justifies what they've done. The real engine behind the slave system is economics. Africans are items of trade. They're things that are bought, that are sold, that are bequeathed, that are inherited. They're like other items of trade. And once you've got that established, both on the slave ships, of which there are thousands leaving British ports, and once you've got that established on the plantations, and once you've got that established as a basis for expanding British wealth, how can you argue that somehow or other the, the, the great inferiority of black people isn't built into fundamental cultural values of, of the British? John Hawkins was perhaps the first English trader to actually kidnap slaves from Tagrim, which is a couple of miles from Freetown, and forcibly uh, took slaves away from Sierra Leone. The sad thing is that this man was even made a knight. When we were in school, we read about Sir John Hawkins as if he was such a good person, he was such a righteous person, somebody who had contributed positively to, you know, the creation of the British Empire. It was only much later that some of us learned with regret that, in fact, uh, he was not only involved in the slave trade, but he actually captured, you know, slaves. He established places down the key, the, down by government wharf, what we call government wharf now. Over time, it became an industry, and a lot of English traders and a lot of Sierra Leonean rulers, particularly those along the coast, became heavily involved in the slave trade. And we have, uh, for instance, several islands of the coast of Sierra Leone that we are prominent slave trading posts, like Bonds Island, for instance, where there were English force, other European South force, even Americans were uh, very heavily involved in the slave trade from Bonds Island. We trade a camp for camp for buy. The kind of, the number there, we a group iron, the number we want, we take camp. We put on this fire room, open, a banner, and of course, we know the way they were taken captured, tied up, chained, and thrown into, into the ships. So it was a very uh, bad experience for the slaves from the moment they were captured up to the time they reached uh, the so-called New World. And then those who survived and did arrive, you know, had to be put for sale. And then when they were bought, they had to undergo all kinds of indignities. One great woman, it could cost two man price. Sometimes it will work for you, not the garden. Not come back, it work for you, it born picking for you. Now for that, it will pay two times for one great woman. When you to come collect two now, go, not come again. At a conservative estimate, over 11 million Africans were transported across the Atlantic. Manacled and packed together like animals, at least two million died during the infernal voyage known as the Middle Passage. Slaves are seen 
as deracinated people, people who did not belong, who were natally alienated. That is, they had no rights of birth, and they were seen as people who uh, had been torn from another society, but not socialized into the new one. So they were socially dead, so to speak. They were seen as people without honor, which is a degraded condition. The value of this for the master is that the master had absolute power over the slave, regardless of what the laws may say. They had rights of life and death. A situation grows up where thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of these black or dark-skinned people are being kept down without rights and kept at work night and day by a system of surveillance uh, with whips and cutlasses. And, of course, there is the fear that they will try and rise up, that they'll try to r run away, and that when they do that, they're going to slaughter the masters and the overseers and their wives in their beds. And really, that any white person will be seen as a potential enemy by uh, the blacks. And so you get this mutual fear between the two groups. And this tends to consolidate racial feeling. And the only way to keep these slave societies even minimally secure was to arm all the white men and even indeed some of the white women too. So you're there in your plantation manor, you're there in your you know, settler outpost. What are the natives doing? Sort of classic line you know, from these movies. The natives are restless. What's going on? Those drums in the background. There's the idea that you know, these people are sort of getting together and they're going to invade us, they're going to attack us. And it's a kind of you know, projection, basically. In other words, you've invaded their countries, you've subordinated them. There's a long history of colored perils. There's the red peril called Red Indians. There's the yellow peril, there's the black peril. There's this idea of you know, the non-white other. And you know, the non-white other is threatening, the non-white other is scary, the non-white other may be coming to attack. And you know, it's, it comes out of, you could say, a bad conscience in part, a sort of subconscious um, recognition perhaps of you know, the kind of things that have been done to the non-white other. In the early 16th century, from Chile in the south to Florida in the north, this non-white other was no more than vermin to be exterminated. The Dominican monk, Bartolome de las Casas, was eyewitness to countless atrocities against the native populations. His account reads like a catalogue of genocide. The mainland in the region known as Florida. The Spaniards murdered many, as is their custom, in order to strike terror into the heart of these people. They made their lives in utter misery, treating them as so many beasts of burden. In another large town, the butchers put the whole town to the sword, young and old, chiefs and commoners, not even the children were spared. The butcher-in-chief arranged for a large number of natives in the area to have their noses, lips and chins sliced from their faces. They were then sent away in unspeakable agony and all running with blood to act as walking testimony to the great deeds and holy miracles performed by these dauntless missionaries of the holy Catholic faith. The, the things that Las Casas witnessed, um, particularly on Hispaniola or in Cuba, um, these incredible crimes, these incredible attacks on Indians, disembowelings and burnings and rapes and whatever else, um, I'm sure that that level of violence is something that you could have witnessed in different places in the 17th, the 18th century, um, you know, in other parts of the Spanish Empire. But it was a peculiarly awful moment that Las Casas saw as the Spanish got to the Americas and tried literally to work the Indians to death. The reports of Las Casas caused enough unease for the Council of the Indies, the Spanish administrators of the New World, to call a debate at Valladolid in Spain in 1550. The debate concerned not just the mistreatment of Indians, but whether they could be categorised as human at all. In contest with Las Casas, the champion of the native populations, was the Jesuit Juan Ginés de Sepulveda. By this time, the Spanish have been in the Americas for about 50 years. And during that time, the brutalities carried out by the conquistadors had reached such heights that it caused some alarm. And out of that context came this particular debate. On the one hand, there was this idea that the Indians had souls, they could be Christianized, and they should be treated not as servants, not as forced laborers, but as people under the protectorate of the Spanish. On the other side of the debate was the idea that perhaps these are not 
people with souls. Perhaps these are people who are natural slaves. And in that context, they could be coerced to produce labor. What Las Casas wanted to do was to change the policy of the Spanish crown towards the Indians. So paradoxically, he was able to get slavery of Indians banned. That's something which the Spanish crown bans, um, outlaws. And by 1542, the laws had been changed to ensure that there can no longer be Indian slaves. But Las Casas also suggests that the labor shortfall in America can be made up with black slaves from Africa, which I think he later regretted later in life. It's a key moment insofar as the reflection on the system that produces race is there in that debate. The system that produces race, which will produce race over the next two, three hundred years, is that colonial system, which takes this diverse range of peoples and defines them as Indian, forces that category on them. And it's in that context that you begin to see two things that go hand in hand with the development of racism. On the one hand, the institutions that keep in place exploited populations, oppressed populations, and in that context, the debates that then take place as to what kinds of populations they are. These debates begin with lawyers, they move to anthropologists, and then they move on to biologists, always debating within that context of colonialism, which fixes those people as objects of investigation. Thursday, 11th October. Thus far and no land, another 12 hours will decide. A crucial moment in the racial history of the whole Atlantic world and of the world is Christopher Columbus, but not the first voyage, which everybody knows about, but the third voyage in 1498. Columbus sailed south to Sierra Leone, where, as he noticed, the people are very black, perfectly black. And then he sailed due west from Sierra Leone, and he wound up near Trinidad and the northern coast of South America. And he reported that the people there were white with blonde hair. And that shouldn't have happened according to the prevailing theories of skin color uh, in the whole classical world in the medieval period. What happened with Columbus is that people started to realize that you could stay on the same latitude and get radically different skin colors. And if that was the case, then there had to be some other explanation for skin color other than geography. So that's where you begin to get the emergence of biological theories of difference in skin color. And that leads eventually to racist theories of differences in skin color. And so a view emerges originally identified as pre-Adamism, that maybe there are multiple uh, origins and that uh, uh, less civilized, more primitive human beings uh, have an origin that is not accountable for by a biblical narrative, but are closer to the animal world. And that view then develops into a view called polygenism, that is multiple origins. When Europeans first encountered chimpanzees, they were really struck by the similarities between what we now call chimpanzees and uh, humans. But they called chimpanzees drills. And one of the questions that John Locke talks about in his essay concerning human understanding is the question of whether human beings have mated with drills. So the question that gets increasingly asked in the 17th century is, are African peoples what we would call the same species as Europeans. And Locke has real questions about whether we can say that they're the same species or not. And one of the explanations for African people that you start hearing in Barbados, for instance, the English colony in Barbados in the 17th century, is that black Africans are produced by the sexual union of a chimpanzee and a human being. So they're not really human, they're half animal. And uh, this gets bound up with a whole series of prejudices about the animality of Africans, their bestiality, their sexuality is animalistic. Uh, even in the 20th century, you get all sorts of claims about jazz music being animalistic. Uh, these are prejudices that begin to be ingrained in European culture in the 17th century in the context of what we think of as major scientific or philosophical texts. And literary texts too, 
In The Tempest, whichever way you interpret Caliban, Shakespeare's weird hybrid reinforces the idea that slaves are not fully human. Shakespeare doesn't quite know how to figure the hewer of wood and drawer of water. Is this the working class? Is this the proletariat? Is this the African? Is this the savage? Shakespeare doesn't know and he creates Caliban. Thou poisonous slave, got by the devil himself upon thy wicked dam, come forth! In The Tempest, it seems to me pretty clear that Shakespeare imagined Caliban as a black slave, he has an African mother and a black devil father, and that in some ways Caliban is the first representation of the rebellious, sexually obsessed, violent, ignorant black slave. I have used thee, filth as thou art, with human care, lodged thee in mine own cell, till thou didst seek to violate the honor of my child. What is it being done? Thou didst prevent me. I had people else this isle with Caliban's. Shakespeare presents him as somebody who will be tricked by a few baubles, you know, not crystal meths, not crack cocaine, but by a, by a few trinkets and some booze. Many a Caliban might have found himself in the English plantations of America. In fact, the Tempest was partly inspired by the story of a ship which ran aground on Bermuda, where the crew then mutinied. The Sea Venture had been bound for the plantations of Virginia, a slaveholding colony in which Shakespeare himself had a financial investment. The economic notion of the plantation as a large site of agribusiness and of a large cooperation of human labor for the arable field uh, begins in, in Ireland, begins in Ulster. Of course, it was a London merchant house that wished to plant dairy and to start the plantation of Ulster at the very time that at Shakespeare's time, at the end, towards the end of Shakespeare's life, that the uh, Virginia Company is establishing a colony in Virginia. The idea that the great glory days of England begin with Elizabeth, you know, there is no successful English colony under the reign of Elizabeth. Great English imperial aggressive victories start happening in the 17th century, really under Cromwell with the growth of the empire and the conquest of Jamaica. And that's when the English also began to perceive of themselves as part of a superior white race. Oliver Cromwell is a, f a fierce and powerful uh, revolutionary figure. He was a great general and commander of capitalism that transformed the Atlantic, if not the whole world. This mighty vision he had of doing God's work had begun in the fens of England, where the huge hydraulic works of Van Muden in Holland are harnessed to drain the fields. So he played a role in that, and to discommon or to remove people from their customary lands in order to produce the, the riches of the alluvial plains of Lincolnshire and the Norfolk Broads. He then transforms that uh, interrelationship, shall we say, of water and land to crossing the Atlantic and to establishing the sugar plantations. He doesn't do this alone, of course. He does it with a class of people. This is why we say the capitalist class, um, because they hope to capitalize the land, turn the land into commodities and then into capital, and do this through the sugar plantation in the 1640s, in the very time of the English Revolution or the English Civil War. It's an amazing story of, of conquest, cruelty, and, and God. So if you look at something like the southern states of America, at, up until the point of the American Civil War, the greatest amount of wealth in America was the ownership of slaves and slave labor. Now this is enormous. And it's in that process of being able to command the resources of other parts of the world, extract them for your industries and that labor, that you create this massive structural inequality. The British become well off on the basis of the slave system. Liverpool, Bristol grow to kind of extraordinary levels of material and urban well-being because of the slave system. Lloyds of London, the Bank of England, Baring's Bank, Barclays Bank. 
Lord Harwood at Harwood House, uh, stately homes left, right and centre, uh, are absolutely rooted in this slave system. But it's a slave system that needs a justification. That is the kind of racist element in it. But the real rationale for it is profit. The, the sort of laundering of slave profits as opposed to simply the relocation um, of them in economic enterprises is, uh, I think, a very important part of the modern uh, development of Britain. For example, I always think of Bristol, the development of Clifton and so on and so forth, absolutely tied to the slave profits from the 18th century, early 19th century slave uh, trade. Slavery as it existed in parts of Europe prior to this period of the Atlantic slave trade was not particularly color-coded. Yes, the slaves in Western Europe might be Slavs, but, you know, they have the same skin color, and you, you couldn't tell by looking at somebody whether he was a slave or not. But, you know, by the time you get to the West Indies in 1700 or something, you can tell by looking at somebody whether or not he or she is a slave. The ancients, by and large, did not suffer from that uh, form of race identification and slavery based on race. But they had their own version of it, which was that all foreigners, all non-Greeks, all outsiders, in principle, could be enslaved legitimately because they were inferior. It's not just people who are not Greek who are regarded as inferior in this sort of unalterable way, but Greek men regarded Greek women in somewhat the same way. So if you are male and Greek, you belong just by that very fact to superior categories. To begin with, racial feeling can take simply the form of aversion, of dislike. But in the case of New World slavery, what it's doing is taking the form of domination, of exploitation, something much more coherent, something much more purposeful. It's not just a, a casual prejudice against people who are unlike ourselves. It's a determination to use those people who are unlike ourselves. So it's this that creates the more intense racial feeling that comes out of uh, the widespread adoption of slavery uh, in the plantations in the Americas. In antiquity, defenders of the institution of slavery didn't rely on ideas of racial inferiority or skin color to justify it. But the ideas of one of the great thinkers of antiquity, who was much quoted in the Valladolid debates, would be adapted to the context of new world slavery. Aristotle, if I could use an awful phrase, is the nigger in the woodpile because his views were looked back to from the later medieval period onwards and cited because Aristotle was regarded as, though unfortunately he wasn't a Christian, he, he lived too early, nevertheless he was um, the next best thing. And if he said slavery was a natural phenomenon, then it probably was. But it's very important to be clear that Aristotle was not speaking in terms of external racial characteristics, colour. Genesis chapter 9, verse 25. And Noah began to be a husbandman, and he An authority even greater than Aristotle's was invoked to justify slavery, God and his good book. Genesis chapter 9, verse 25, was interpreted by Christians as divine authorization for trafficking in slaves and the ownership of plantations. I and mean, this is kind of a funny story, and from our perspective it seems sort of ridiculous, but this was taken very seriously indeed. After the flood, Noah gets out, there are still waters all around, and so Noah decides he's going to set up a vineyard. Noah gets drunk. He has three sons, Japheth, Shem, and Ham. Ham goes into Noah's chamber while he's lying in this inebriated state, and then takes off the sheet, looks down at Noah, and then calls in his brothers. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his and father. And says, look at our father who's lying naked, and tries to get his brothers to laugh. When Noah comes around from his stupor, he's furious, and he pronounces a curse on Ham's descendants. And he said, cursed be Canaan, the servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. So he says that Ham's son, who's called Canaan, will from then on be cursed in perpetuity, and he'll be a slave to the other two brothers, Shem and Japheth. 
Curse of Ham was not specifically black from the beginning. There was a medieval writer representing the lords of the manor saying the peasants are the descendants of Ham. And that's why they have to serve. The word slave originally originated from Slavic. And these were people who had been captured on the eastern frontiers of Europe. And it was not until about the 15th century when the Portuguese in West Africa began to specifically identify Africans with the curse. But the idea is that one branch of the human family has been enslaved because of this curse, which Noah pronounced on Ham. It's a kind of one-size-fits-all oppressor's story because you can decide whatever group it is that you want to enslave or oppress are the descendants of Ham, and therefore you have a biblical justification for your mistreatment of them. Christianity is, it's, it does different things at different times. Um, in other words, there's certainly a strand of, of, of thinking in which people justify slavery by arguing that it's bringing pe you know, people in Africa into Christianity and so forth. Christianity is just one aspect of a number of different systems of thinking that would create the colonial basis for the kinds of knowledge which will be used to define non-European populations. So you move from Christianity to liberalism, to notions of humanitarianism, to capitalism. All these kinds of interventions are part of trying to manage and make sense of what the colonial enterprise is without questioning the colonial enterprise, without questioning what Atlantic slavery is. Christianity's role in slavery is very complex. For most of its history, it basically accepted slavery as part of the order of things. In a way, the parallel would be the attitude towards a homeless person today. I mean, we see it not as a sin or as evil, but as an unfortunate situation. And this continued right up to the middle of the 18th century, when a truly radical change took place in which some Christian thinkers began to see slavery as a sin. Enslavement of the natives of North America was never European policy, but that didn't make life any easier for these indigenous peoples, whose relationship with the settlers would ultimately leave most of them either victimized or dead. If you look at um, Native Americans from their perspective, when white people arrived, they were a disruption, they were shocking, and they were um, surprising in all sorts of ways. But for many Indians, they simply looked at them as another rival group. And this is one of the interesting facts about 17th century American history. From Indians' perspectives, whites were in a way a bit similar to other rival Indian nations. So perhaps you'd trade with whites, perhaps you'd make war with whites, perhaps you'd ally with the whites against another Indian nation. Indians didn't see things in white and red, if you want to put it that way, white and red terms, because the white settlements weren't powerful enough until much later in the 17th century, even into the 18th century. So they didn't see this as an invasion, as a form of genocide in a way that would unite them as Indians against white people. The ways and thoughts of the white men are strange. But for all that our skins are of different hues, we are friends, Chingachgook. You could talk about the 18th century as a hundred year period in which Indians increasingly realize that the battle is between them and white people. And in 1763, when it became clear to a host of different Indian groups in the Midwest that the wind was changing, they launched a rebellion. It was led by an Ottawa Indian named Pontiac, laid siege to the British fort at Detroit. He didn't succeed in destroying the fort, but he got the people there very scared indeed. And it made London aware of the problem of managing Indian especially in the Midwest. And one of the most extraordinary things that happened is that George III declared in the autumn of 1763 a line of proclamation, that's what it was called, the line of proclamation which forbade any white settler from settling beyond the Appalachian Mountains without his explicit permission. So effectively, the idea was to put the brakes on white settlement to preserve British trading relationships with the Indians. But of course, the irony here is you've got tons of white settlers moving to America looking for land. So in effect, in 1763, this royal proclamation creates a new tension between ordinary white settlers on the ground and the crown. And it's definitely one of the contributing factors in the American Revolution. White settlers believe after 1763 that the British government 
doesn't support them and instead it backs the Indians. And after the American Revolution, or in the process of the American Revolution, the gloves really come off for white Americans and the new United States is not an Indian-friendly nation in the least. Native Americans were in an impossible situation. Side with the British, whose stronghold was Fort Detroit, and they risked the wrath of the rebel colonists based in Fort Pitt. Side with these Americans and their militiamen, and they would invite merciless retribution from the British. And as for trying to stay out of it, even if you were in Pennsylvania, a state founded by Quakers upon principles of Christian brotherly love, this too could have fatal consequences. Now, one group that didn't pick one side or the other were the Moravian Christian Indians, who were gathered in three little communities, the most important of which was called Gnadenhuten. These Moravian Christians, there are maybe 100, 150, had tried to stay out of the war. They weren't hostile Indians. They had adopted many of the customs, the equipment, the technology of white people. They read the Bible. They sang hymns. They were, to all intents and purposes, the dream model of people back in the 17th century who wanted to convert and civilize Indians. And then a group of Pennsylvania militiamen arrived. When they had taken everything that they had that could be construed as a weapon, you know, tools, axes, whatever, that, that the Indians had, which could be used against, against them, the militiamen got together and decided to kill every one of them. So every single Indian, in fact, the majority were women and children. I think there were around 30 men, so the rest, 60 or so, were women and children. All of them were massacred. They were brought in, in pairs to a hut where they were hit over the head with a cooper's mallet and their brains were dashed out without any regard to their obviously being non-combatants. And at the end of the massacre, the white militiamen who'd committed it melted away. There was never any legal action taken against them. And their argument was that these Indians had tools with writing on them, or they had books, or they had implements they could only have stolen from white people. And that's the tragedy or the irony of all of this. In a way, the things that showed that those Christian Indians were civilized were used against them because these militiamen couldn't believe they belonged to them. But I think that's a tremendously evocative story for Pennsylvania because what began as this noble experiment with white people and Indians living side by side had now turned into this most grisly kind of race war in which the distinctions between good and bad Indian are totally erased. It goes back to one of the problems, I guess, for Americans, white settlers. What does it mean to be an American? What is there about America as a place which defines the people that live there? When the Boston Tea Party took place in December of 1773, there's protest against the tea taxes which are being imposed by London, and you get these patriots running onto these ships of the British East India Company and pouring the tea into the harbour. They dressed as Indians. Now that to me is tremendously interesting because they dressed as Indians to prove they were American. It's as if when you get past the stage of mastering Indians militarily, they become incredibly useful culturally in articulating Americanness, the idea of being American. And you know, there's a reason why there are cars called, you know, the Cherokee, you know, or the Pontiac. I mean, you line up the major Indian leaders, line up the major Indian tribes, and you can probably find a vehicle or a weapon named after one. You know, the Apache helicopter, you know, Tomahawk missile. You don't have to look very far to find that kind of connection. And many people have pointed out the Indian appears on the nickel, but the African appears on, on no coins. And so, the Indian was sort of a symbol of America in a way. Not, no, not the full destiny of America was to be civilized and Indians were to become civilized or they were to die out. But they still identified with America in a way that Africans could not be. The one thing that comes to mind looking at it over a long period of time is that one of the main distinguishing features of black-white relations in the United States has been the idea of the so-called one-drop rule purity of blood. To be white, you had to, you could not have a known black ancestor. It wasn't always enforced, but this was the rule. Indian uh, blood and intermarriage with Indians, going back to John Rolfe and Pocahontas, was not taboo. So that when Oklahoma became a state, it was interesting, the Oklahoma Constitution, uh, there were a number of uh, part Indian figures who were involved in the setting up of the Oklahoma state government when it was in 1910. And the law said there could be no marriage between whites and blacks, and no marriage between Indians and blacks. But <laughs> that left the Indians and whites to freely intermarry. The mid-18th century is considered a pivotal historical moment. In 
when the Enlightenment dream of the Brotherhood of Man, championed by philosophers like David Hume, Voltaire, Rousseau, and the Encyclopedists, came to prominence. This period gave rise to the ideals of liberty, equality, and fraternity, principles that fueled the American and French revolutions. But these popular democratic principles were never universally applied. Choose any intellectual giant of the Enlightenment, and almost without exception, you will have chosen a proponent of equal rights, who really believes that some men are more equal than others. Kant is seen as you know, one of the most important philosophers of the modern period of the past few hundred years. And he's certainly seen as the most important moral philosopher in that the crucial idea is this idea of personhood and you respect the personhood of others, you don't diss other people. And yet simultaneous with that, Kant also has his writings in anthropology and physical geography in which he basically outlines a kind of four-tiered level of human beings. It's basically a racially restrictive view of personhood, that a prerequisite for being a personhood is basically being white. It's only the European tier, the sort of top tier, who have what it takes to become full persons. And um, Asians, one rung below Europeans, blacks, one rung below that, Native Americans, these are the tiers. Even if they're human, they're not full persons. The Enlightenment is a two-edged sword. It, it provided the basis for an argument for the social and political equality of all men. Uh, but at the same time, it provided the opportunity to uh, look at human beings not as you know, children of God, but as varieties of, of animal. So if you decide that certain human beings are not human, they don't belong to the same species, then of course they don't have any right to sign contracts, and they can't be part of the social contract that forms your political system. And that's exactly what happens in these early democracies, is that blacks don't have any voting rights. Many of the philosophers writing this period played a crucial rationalizing role in justifying European imperialism, in justifying the domination of whites over people of color. So why is it then that um, these things are not more widely known? Why has the current establishment not taken up this issue? The marginalization of issues like this sort of you know, goes in tandem with the sanitized view of mainstream philosophers. So that you, know, you, you represent Locke, you represent Kant, you represent Hegel, you represent these people in ways that you know, does not address the sort of racist dimensions of their thought. And that sort of you know, contributes to a picture of the modern period from which race has been whitewashed out. In the name of their majesties, Ferdinand and Isabella, King and Queen of Castile, Leon and Aragon, I now take possession of this land and name it San Salvador. In spite of the atrocities perpetrated by the Spanish and Portuguese after the discovery of the New World, the colonizers eventually developed a society that allowed Europeans to mix with Indians on a scale that was unthinkable in French and English North America. But in the South, it was expedient for the settlers. They had to multiply or die out because there just weren't enough of them to go round. The Spanish had a very different understanding of the Indians than the British did. I mean, I think uh, from the earliest moments of settlement, Spaniards tended to regard Indians as people that they could fold into their social system. Not because they were nicer people, the Spanish necessarily, but because for a variety of reasons, there were fewer white people in Spanish America. Because Spain never colonized America with anything like the number of colonists that England and eventually Britain brought over. I mean, the number of Spaniards, peninsulares as they were known, people from the Iberian Peninsula that actually came to Latin America, was much, much smaller. One sees emerging in the period of the Enlightenment, in the latter part of the 18th century, as abolitionism is beginning to take root in that part of the world as well, a much more vigorous form of, of mixed race interaction that you find in other parts of the world. It's a different tradition coming out of southern European colonization, uh, Portuguese on one hand, Spanish on the other, and out of this a greater willingness to engage in forms of mixed interaction, mixed intercourse, and um, identified and acknowledged mixed race 
populations uh, emerging. And out of this you get in the last 30 years, uh, really 1760 to 1790, uh, in Mexico, Mexico City in particular, but you also get uh, versions, versions of this in Peru and elsewhere, of what comes to be called custer painting, mixed race painting, cast painting you might uh, even call it, which characterizes in explicit classificatory terms and after all, classification is uh, an emergent form of rationality of Enlightenment thinking. And the Custer painting lays out the forms of, of, of offspring uh, that emerge from uh, certain kinds of mixture, mixture between what they call Spaniard and, uh, and Indian on the one hand, Spaniard and black on the other, in other words, European or white with other racial forms, uh, Indian and African, and then uh, mixtures as well with the, the mixtures of the mixtures, so to speak. So you get various gradations, and you might even call it degradations, of racial mixing that go from mestizo and so on. If the color lines were not rigidly drawn between just two races, but you had a at least, at least one intermediate race, uh, and mulattoes or... Uh, brown people, the, the presence of the, the mulatto in those colonies, the importance of mulattoes in Brazil as an intermediate group, the importance of mestizos in Spanish uh, colonies with large Indian population, is something that I think does distinguish the United States with its basically two-category system, you're either white or you're black. South America is very complex and fascinating. It's different, but it wasn't necessarily any better. It's easy to be fooled by the system because you go there and you see blacks and whites among the poor mixing together, whereas they don't in the United States. Because what the U.S. did with this one-drop rule was to encourage a sense of solidarity among whites as a way of dividing them from blacks. And one reason you never had working-class solidarity in America is because the one-drop rule and the binary system of race is a powerful tool for dividing the working classes, what between whites and blacks. And the lower down the system you go, the more economically uh, vulnerable and marginal the white person is, the more he's inclined to be racist because it's the only way in which he has some status. He says, at least I'm not black. And so the white poor and the black poor are totally against each other. So it became a perfect system of division. Latin American societies are far more racist at the top than the United States. I mean, the Brazilian military brass is completely white. The Brazilian political elite is, until recently, completely white. Whereas in the United States, the higher up you go now, because of civil rights laws and so on, the more integrated the population, and the American political elite is, is thoroughly integrated. I mean, the, the Secretary of State is black, you know, the, um, the Congressional Black Caucus is very powerful. Part of the reason for this is that the way black Americans took over the one-drop rule and turned it to their own ends for mobilization and solidarity. Whereas in, in Brazil, uh, they go on about their racial democracy. All they mean by that is that white men were going to bed with black women and, and not feeling guilty about it and producing uh, mixed kids whom they great beauty queens. But the system remained viciously unequal. Brazil is the most unequal society in, in the Western world. And, uh, and blacks are, are completely at the bottom. Uh, so it's a pernicious system. It's apartheid without apartheid laws. And at the top, it's thoroughly racist. If contemporary democracies can be called racist, then it should come as no surprise that over 200 years ago, a very early democratic experiment in Sierra Leone went badly wrong. Freetown became the home of the black loyalists ex-slaves who freed themselves by fighting for the British in the American War of Independence. But their freedom turned out to be very limited because of the dictates of their former British masters. To some extent, what's interesting about Sierra Leone is how accidental the whole story is. These people, in a sense, have become refugees and have become British because they'd actually crossed the lines during the American Revolution to fight for the British. So in 1775, the British governor of Virginia said that if black people who were slaves would cross lines, would leave their plantations, leave the Americans, if you like, and fight for him, for the British, they'd win their freedom. But the British weren't committed in any deep way during the American Revolution to racial equality or even to emancipation. It was a strategic military move. 
When this colony was established in 1787, it was meant to be a free colony. But for a variety of reasons, it didn't work that way. The problems with the colony inhabitants uh, really came to the forefront with the arrival of the Nova Scotian settlers. These were uh, blacks who had helped the British during the American War of Independence, and they had been promised some land in Nova Scotia. They were called the Black Loyalists. Uh, so many of the promises that the British made to them were never fulfilled. The tragedy of Sierra Leone in the 1790s is the difficulty, the almost impossibility, I guess, for whites of letting black people run the colony. I mean, it was constantly run by or overseen by white people. And black people, I think, didn't think that's how it was going to work out. They imagined they'd have much, much more power and authority. They wouldn't just be electing constables, they'd be running the colony, and that didn't happen. These Nova Scotian settlers that came here had all the resources that could enable them to govern themselves as an independent people. They had black pastors, they had black politicians who had mobilized them in Canada to move over to Sierra Leone. So they really had the human resource to be able to govern themselves as a free and independent people. You have a view that emerges at the same time and fuels abolitionism, the claim that those who are, who are not European or of European descent are, are historically immature by contrast with those who are European or, or European settlers. Europeans see themselves as having um, the obligation, the burden to civilize, so I think it's still with us today. Uh, one sees it in relation to the invasion of Iraq, for example. Uh, you know, we will come in and teach you how to govern yourselves because you haven't been able to govern yourselves hitherto. It was really a great opportunity that was lost because had these people been given the opportunity to govern themselves, it is possible that perhaps Sri Lanka would never have been colonized in the real sense of the word. And Sri Lanka could probably have been the first black African country to be free of colonial rule. I believe there are a few events in my life which have not happened to many. Olauda Equiano, whose first slave name was Gustava Vasa, obtains his freedom in London and becomes a key figure in the abolitionist movement. His uh, autobiography really becomes the, the transforming political document to the abolitionist movement. Olauda Equiano is just one of the great campaigners consigned to the margins of history, while William Wilberforce is represented as the all-conquering hero who abolished slavery. However, no matter which great abolitionist you choose, you will find even greater forces behind them, from the radical Christianity of the Quakers to the workers forming what would become the trades union movement. The other thing about Equiano was he's the one who connected the artisans of the London Corresponding Society in 1792. He connected them with the steel workers, the coal miners, and the factory workers of Sheffield. And it was this conjunction of the industrial proletariat and the artisans of London, which historians have often seen as the beginning of the English working class as a whole. But it was Olauda Equiano who had brought them together. The period where you see the most solidarity between enslaved Africans and the white working class, uh, in Britain anyway, I think were the, the early years of the abolition movement. Starting in the late 1780s, hundreds of thousands of Britons signed petitions to Parliament against the slave trade. And amazingly, a lot of these petitions came from workers. There were 769 metal workers in Sheffield who signed a remarkable petition to Parliament that said, in effect, you might expect us to be in favor of the slave trade because we sell a lot of the wares we make to the captains of slave ships who use them as trading goods to buy slaves in Africa, but we want to express our solidarity with our African brethren, and uh, we are told that they do not wish to be slaves. It's a very slow movement, a kind of shifting of the kind of tectonic plates underneath Western life, late 18th century. And the shift is, you know, enlightenment writing and kind of changes in theological views. But the, those small tectonic changes produce tremendous changes above. And one of the things that they do is to open to question the very existence of the slave trade and slavery. The decisive event that affected all of culture at the time it has to be the first successful slave revolution in human history and the successful 
break from European imperial powers. And that's the Haitian War of Independence that breaks out in August 1791. It's one island originally colonized by the Spanish who effectively abandon the western portion of the island, which the French squat on and eventually create their own colony on, which they call Saint-Domingue. The other thing I think to just to remember is that this was the most successful colony in the Americas. I mean, we think of it today as it's a, a, a poorest nation in the, the Americas. It's always t talked about in those terms. At that time, it really was the richest site. It wasn't a nation of its own, but the richest colony in the Americas. The productivity was enormous. So for every, in a sense, empire in, in the Americas, in a sense, had their eye on it, um, would have loved to be able to take control of that, of that sector of the economy. In the beginning of the revolution happened really in the northern plain of Saint-Domingue, which really was this extremely industrialized zone in which there were these enormous sugar plantations. That's where really where the revolution began, and I think that's important to remember as well, that these plantations, which were some of the most industrial sites in the world at the time, in terms of the combination of both of agriculture and production, generated this revolution, and it came out of these plantations. The first stage of the, of the revolution in 1791 was essentially about the slaves establishing control over these plantation domains. They transformed these wealthy plantations into their camps. One of the most interesting things that uh, African historians have suggested about the revolution is that one of the reasons it may have succeeded is that there were huge numbers of men who had served in armies in Africa, who had been soldiers in Africa, who had been enslaved as a result of uh, after participating in wars in Africa, and they brought their military experience to Saint-Domingue. 1793, Britain and France went to war. And Britain saw a chance to do two things in one go. To seize this very wealthy territory for itself, away from its enemy France, and to suppress the slave revolt before it could spread to Jamaica, which was very close by. A huge British force headed for Saint-Domingue, and for five years they fought the rebel slaves there who came under the leadership of Toussaint Louverture, the great Haitian leader, and they lost. The attempted repression of that revolt involved hundreds of thousands of English boys and young men who were shipped off to Haiti. And there they will meet at the other end of a bayonet or the other end of a machete, the historic indignation of slaves fighting for freedom. And it's a huge trauma to the English people. This was a case where an army of rebel slaves had defeated the army of the world's superpower, uh, which was also the world's greatest slave trading nation. And it was a great shock. The same can be said of the French, right, who have also, I mean, who later lost against essentially the same troops when they tried to reestablish slavery. Um, the British defeat was, in a, in a sense, presaged the, the defeat of Napoleon's troops that would follow a few years later. This revolution seemed kind of unthinkable for certain, for, for a lot of thinkers. I mean, the idea that this was happening in some ways, the idea that slaves would become generals and leaders of a revolution and would defeat these armies, it was just really hard to kind of fit into what they believed and what they saw. Now, a lot of people, of course, did think about it and, and, and brought it into their reality. But I think it challenged at the time and continues to challenge so many of our notions about where history is made, how history is made, who are the central actors in history. This is really one of the foundational moments in the history of not just the Americas politically, but in democratic theorizing of philosophy, of, of thinking about what rights are. So not only do you have a challenge to racist ideas that kind of consign people to the margins of history rather than placing them at the center, but you also have to rethink, I think, a lot of broader narratives about Western history. What's interesting about the Haitian Revolution is that it's the only revolution with the only constitution that outlaws slavery and outlaws discrimination on the basis of race. Now that is historic. That's not in the Bill of Rights in the US. It's not part of the unwritten constitution of the British Empire. But it's part of that history of opposing racism which actually comes from the enslaved themselves and not from the so-called humanitarian efforts of the abolitionist movement which couldn't have been successful unless the slaves themselves were making slavery unstable. The cost they paid for it was a terrible one because um, there was this you know, um, international boycott of Haiti and in the end they had to pay 
reparations. It's not that reparations were paid to the slaves. They had to pay reparations to the French for, you know, property expropriated and so forth. I mean, one of the reasons that Haiti is today the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere comes out of this, that, you know, they, they do this tremendous historical feat. So here's the only successful slave revolution in history. And basically, okay, we are going to make sure that the contagion of your example does not spread to the United States, does not spread to Latin America. We're going to isolate you, we're going to quarantine you, we're going to make you pay. Slavery itself isn't abolished in the British Islands until 1833. And indeed, there are still Africans carried across the Atlantic to Cuba and Brazil, illicitly, another more than a million. And slavery doesn't end in America till the Civil War, it doesn't end in Cuba and Brazil till 1888. The sad truth of many situations like this where there's a huge change on paper, a huge change on paper doesn't change people's material conditions of life because what happened was British slaves finally became officially free August 1st, 1838, but for almost all of them there was no work available except continuing to cut sugar cane. And now they suddenly found themselves having to pay rent to the planters for the miserable huts that they lived in and taxes to the government. And there were also all kinds of other strategies used essentially to prevent former slaves from gaining access to land, to prevent them from gaining access to the cities, to prevent them from gaining access to the professions and so forth. So there were all kinds of other strategies, all of them really largely tied together by a broader racial order that also kind of sustained a certain kind of subordination without slavery. Many of the abolitionists could see that it was unjust and it was cruel to perpetuate a system where people were enslaved and degraded. But that did not necessarily mean that they saw those people who were degraded and enslaved as civilized like them. So there is a disconnect. And it's a disconnect that has to be marked and given some significance because historically we often think that abolitionism was like an anti-racist movement. It wasn't an anti-racist movement. You know, Britain moved out of slavery straight into a wider and deeper colonial empire. I think it's important that the British try and temper their sense of themselves and the sense of their past with an awareness that uh, their history is not all drums and trumpetry. It's not all the kind of glories. It comes with a kind of a rather dark stain to it, a rather dark side to it. What's Rule Britannia about? Written in the 1740s when Britain did rule the waves, but in the 1740s the British are carrying 40,000 Africans a year across the Atlantic. Never will be slaves. Britain never will be slaves. Of course, the end of slavery opened up all kinds of possibilities for contestation that simply were not there before. Um, so I think it's the, the change was crucial, um, and ex-slaves mobilized political institutions, legal institutions, religious institutions, and were able to do so and kind of push forward. Um, but it is striking, I think, that, that in a sense the struggle to really bring about a, a complete you know, end or complete erasure of, of all the effects and legacies of slavery is still continuing in a lot of ways. Chancellor Gordon Brown has come to India to talk about trade and jobs, but instead he's having to reassure his hosts that Britain's not a racist country. I think uh, we want to send the message, as I do most, I know most British people, that we are a nation of fairness and tolerance, uh, and that is how I think most of the world want to understand. And the fear was that a row about Britain's past, if you like, about attitudes that many people thought should have gone and had gone, might actually hamper our future.